Welcome back to Bay Sunday. You may remember where you were when this story broke some 34 years ago. The Jonestown Massacre. Nearly a thousand people died all under the influence of the Reverend Jim Jones in Jonestown. Now, we've heard a lot about Mr. Jones, but what about the people that were in that camp and their families and those that escaped? Well, a new book called Thousand Lives is giving us some insight into their stories, and here to chat about it is the author, Julia Shears. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me on. No, do you remember where you were? Do, do you remember the story? Are you old enough for that? Yes, I am. <laughs> yeah, me too. I was uh, living in Indiana. I was 12 years old, and I remember the, you know, the front page of both Newsweek and Time magazine were the bodies in the jungle after it happened. It was a big event because we, the, the Moscone assassination, Harvey Milk, happened, what, a week and a half later, Yeah, right? 10 days later. So there was a lot going on, especially here in San Francisco. Well, why did you write the book? You've got a, a personal reason, I guess, right? Well, my first book is a memoir called Jesus Land about growing up in Indiana with an adopted black brother. And one of the themes of that book is always the quest to belong. And so I think had we come across Jim Jones Church, which was integrated, it was black, white, sitting side by side, you know, I, I think we would have been really attracted to what he had to say. And the more you read about this guy, the FBI, uh, I guess, disclosed some 50,000 pages of documents right. and information. You were able to read that and then go That's out right. and ask your own questions. Uh, he was an evil man, and he had this planned out long before you thought you were joining a church, right. you know, to have the good life, but not well, the case. That's what interested me most, was what the rank and file, what happened to the rank and file members. You know, the leadership knew that Jim Jones wanted to do this thing called revolutionary suicide. He was planning it for years before he moved his congregation to Guyana, but the rank and file had no idea. So they went down there thinking, you know, I'll go down there, spend a couple of months. If I don't like it, I'll just go back to San Francisco, not knowing that he was never going to allow them to come home. And a lot of these people didn't want to be there after a while, right? No. I mean, one of the most eerie things I found in the FBI files were all of these notes from people asking him, you know, please let us go back to San Francisco. You know, my children is, are having nightmares. I don't know how to tell them that death is a good thing. Please let us come home. And he told them that if they wanted to go back, they could swim back because he wasn't going to pay their way. And the more you dig into this information that you got and talk to some of the families of some of the victims, uh, what did you learn about this man, Jim Jones? Very scary, disturbing man who was supported by this inner circle who was as depressive and nihilistic as he was. How did no one out him? How, how did this get so far as to you know, almost 1,000 people? Because, again, he had this very close inner circle who were completely bought into his vision yeah. that, you know, they needed to commit revolutionary suicide to, you know, support socialism. And you talked to some of the family members. I did. Um, Thirty-some-odd years removed now. What was that like? Well, my book follows five people to Jonestown, so the reader can learn why these people were attracted to Jim Jones how they got to Guyana and what they thought once they were finally in Guyana when Jim Jones was start, starting to talk about having everyone die. So one of the people I follow was a teenager named Tommy Bogue, who a year before the massacre actually ran away from Jonestown with another 16-year-old, was caught and brought back, and then on the final day was able to escape with Congressman Ryan, who went down there to see what was going on. Right. And he didn't make it, obviously. Mr. Tommy, Ryan. Mr. Mr. Ryan didn't make it, but Tommy Bogue, the teenager, did. He's actually a, a councilman in Dixon, California Dixon, today. Dixon, California. And what was, is, is there closure? Is it still raw? What's no. it like when you talk to these people? It was very difficult. I had a lot of people say that they don't want to be mentioned in the book, even. There's such a stigma associated with the Jonestown massacre because the media labeled these people as baby killers, as cultists, as sheep, not knowing what really happened and how trapped they were in Jonestown. So that's what I'm hoping, that people who read my book will have a better understanding and more empathy for what really happened down there. And did you go to Guyana as I did. well? What was that like? And what's it, what's it like yeah. now down there, I guess? There, there's nothing there. There's a couple old rusting tractor bodies, but it's this, this field that's been you know, no memorial, no nothing. There's nothing there. It's just this field that's been, you know, full of weeds and wildflowers. And uh, and the reaction of the book thus far? It's been great. I've gotten thank you notes from survivors saying thank you for telling our story in a way that's respectful. 
you know, and, and sharing that we were really trapped down there and there was no way out. Well, we wish you all the best. It's a very interesting okay. read, uh, very personal, yeah. very personal. Thank you so Thank much you. for coming in. Thanks. Appreciate it. If you'd like to get a copy of A Thousand Lives, you can log on to Julia Shears. That's S-C-H-E-E-R-E-S dot -E 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 com. That's it for this week's edition of Bay Sunday. We are back next week. In the meantime, have a good week, everybody. Happy Sunday.